I think you will have almost a, an overnight, people have the, the aha moment of, oh wow, I could maybe get to the airport like this, or I could commute to work like this, or, you know, heaven forbid, there's a medical emergency in my building. I don't have to wait for, you know, an ambulance to come. Talking Joby here, uh, the guys in California, and Travis, thank you very much for taking the time. Question on jurisdiction. Um, read a lot of uh, critical uh, articles here out of Europe. Um, how do you compare Europe versus the US in terms of EV toll uh, deployment? Well, here in the States, and in particular to California, Los Angeles, where I am, you know, just the fact is that we have police helicopters, we have commercial helicopters, uh, whether it's news or you know, medical, and then also private helicopters flying around all the time. People are used to these things being in the air. Also, we just are, it's so vast here. Um, we have the FAA to rely for our entire country. And one challenge I think, you know, is my opinion, but just as you zoom out and you know, physically just look at the map of Europe, um, it, it's quite closely packed together. And you're gonna have challenges with, you know, jurisdictions, people flying over a certain border, but although that might be, you know, a typical train ride um, or, or something that's you know, commonplace for, for travel there, I think becomes a, a challenge. And also in Asia, um, they just have a little bit more flexibility of um, rules and, and depending on who's involved uh, investment wise, I think you see that with Ehang where they're going to let them push uh, a little bit, you know, further um, against the boundaries than maybe some other players and in, in other industries. Yeah, and you also just mentioned that it's quite common in the US um, and as you're familiar with that market in California, um, could you share a bit of just how big that market is for helicopter transportation in California as of now? Certainly, so currently um, Los Angeles would be, you know, the leading edge of the rotorcraft world in terms of um, charter flights on the West Coast. New York and Florida would be for the East Coast, but here in LA, luckily we have, you know, it's almost like 300 days of the year where there's sunshine and no clouds, which makes it very helpful for commercial helicopters, uh, typically charter flights to fly because they'll be flying under VFR or visual flight rules. And um, you start to get a little bit trickier with weather um, when you fly IFR, so instrument flight rules, and that's where you have more um, twin engine helicopters, Sikorsky S-76 is the most common place for, for charter flights. But here, luckily, we, weather uh, is a blessing. And so you have you know numerous flights that will typically be between Los Angeles and Orange County. Drive time, um, it's about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, in terms of miles, we don't really think of things in miles here in Los Angeles because it takes so long to get everywhere. But um, I think it's maybe you know 20 miles away. So uh, it, it takes quite a bit of time. but. The other flights, typically down in San Diego, you have a lot of tour flights. Um, the numbers, hundreds per day, um, and that's just here in the LA area alone, but uh, up and down the, the, the southern part of the state. Quick follow-up question on that one. Of course, in the air, there's also separation you need to keep in mind. So congestion can actually also happen <laughs> in air travel. Uh, so perhaps if you take over all that um, car travel with air travel, the, the air might become as congested. What is your take on that? Certainly, well, that's actually a great point here. Um, I live. You know, about five minutes drive from LAX. And so um, there is some particular flight rules here. Um, LA is, is quite dense, but you start to have um, what they're going to plan out for, for EV tolls and how they'll enter the space. So most commercial airliners that are leaving to and from Los Angeles fly around 4,000 to 5,000 feet, plus or minus, right? Obviously there is quite a bit of traffic, but for helicopters, that's mostly, uh, and rotorcraft, it's mostly around 1,000 feet. So because of that, you can you know, create some pretty safe dis distances. And you know, in terms of strains on the system, um, which I think is, is probably m more of your question of well, if you have so many people flying in the air, not just colliding, but how do you manage all of that? Um, there is, you know, as airspace is vertical, um, we can still create pockets where there's a, quite a bit of uh, density of aircraft, rotorcraft without you know affecting the commercial traffic. Obviously around runways and things like that, um, those are, are where I think the most amount of, um, not necessarily regulation, but there will be very specific rules of how people enter and leave, which helicopters already have now, but uh, I think that will maybe another topic we can touch on, but um, other areas for these EV tolls to work from may not be at 
the large international airports, but nearby regional airports or even smaller vertiports, um, I, I think that's also going to be a crucial piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and talking about vertiports, I mean, there are quite a few locations in the US that are now limited due to noise uh, regulation, for example. So how would that change with Joe becoming in with a much lower noise footprint? Certainly, and, and I think this is uh, often talked about, obviously, Joby, um, some of their technology, you know, specific will create you know, the, the most quiet aircraft uh, in terms of EV toll, but even rotorcraft uh, in general. I think people will have to see how quiet it is because it's, we're not used to something that's so large to not make sound. Uh, I, I can tell you just from personal experience, having been there you know, at the factory and having the chance to see it fly, it's, you know, was maybe 30 meters away from me. And when it took off, we would just be talking like a, a subway or a train car just passed by, but maybe even less. It, it, it just doesn't impact how you, but it's hard to believe until you see it. But once that happens, I think you'll have a lot of areas just for the, the economic benefits that can come from, um, I can speak to here in Los Angeles, If you look at an aerial picture uh, of, of Los Angeles, and I would actually um, ask you know, maybe some of the listeners of this to see what that looks like, you will see that there's helipads on a gross, uh, you know, the gross majority of, of high-rise buildings here in Los Angeles. Once upon a time, there was a law that said after, um, if you built above a certain height, that you had to put one on the top of every building, and that, that was for emergencies. A lot of them have now been decommissioned, but the helipads still exist. And so um, if you look at downtown Los Angeles in particular, they've started to build a bunch of, a bunch of residential buildings. Um, there happens to be a, a landing pad that I have personally been a part of arranging flights to and, and been on the top of as they're landing. It's quite loud for residents. But when we get to a point where they could just trial, if you must, or, or um, have a, an exhibit that would show Landy, uh, Joby landing on these buildings, I think you will have almost a, an overnight, people have the, the aha moment of, oh wow, I could maybe get to the airport like this, or I could commute to work like this, or, you know, heaven forbid, there's a medical emergency in my building. I don't have to wait for, you know, an ambulance to come downstairs and for the firemen to come up 50 floors. I could just be taken off the roof and taken to the best hospital in the area, maybe not just the closest one. So, I, you know, th there's all sorts of really unique things there.